The Happy Time Murders just arrived in theaters, and the reviews are not what anyone expected. The movie has taken a bit of a beating with the critics and a big hit at the box office, but with so much awesome stuff going for it, what happened? Here are some reasons why this movie maybe didn't do as well as it could have, and some of it is seriously confusing. Make sure to hit the red subscribe button and ring the notification bell to stay up to date with the latest from Screen Rant. Sugar. In a world that is half inhabited by human beings and half by puppets, it's obvious there are going to be some things that require us to suspend our disbelief and just accept as the reality of the movie it takes place in. But one of the first confusing things is that Connie, played by Melissa McCarthy, is addicted to sugar. She snorts it repeatedly, and it seems to have the same effect as one of the drugs would, rather than just making her hungry for more. But if Connie is still a human being, why does sugar affect her any differently than it does the rest of us? You might think it's a different type of sugar, or at least a code name for a drug of some kind, but they refer to it as grade A sucrose, which pretty much means it's just your regular everyday refined sugar. Do people in this world still use sugar in cooking and baking, or is everyone getting high by having a cookie or a piece of chocolate? I just want to know what you know about the happy time murders. Connie's liver. Despite all of the advancements in medicine these days, organ transplants are a tricky thing. But in this movie, Melissa McCarthy's Connie is burdened by the fact that she actually has a puppet liver transplant. While again, we know part of this movie is not thinking too hard about the nuts and bolts of it all and just letting it be the raunchy comedy that it was made to be, the fact that her liver is made from felt makes literally no sense whatsoever. It doesn't have any of the functions of an actual human liver and would pretty much just disintegrate into her body and probably poison her. No wonder her sugar habit is out of control. She must know a puppet liver made out of fabric can't actually serve any purpose for a human being. And no matter how many drugs she does, it's pretty much going to be useless. Also, who even performed her surgery? We seriously hope it wasn't a puppet, as their lack of opposable thumbs might make it a little difficult to hold a scalpel, let alone properly attach an organ and then stitch her back up afterwards. Film Noir, kind of. While it's clear that the inspiration for this movie was a lot of old-school film noir from the golden age of Hollywood, with the hardened private detective getting pulled back in by the classic femme fatale character, the similarities pretty much stop there. Audiences expected it to go the way of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which has a very similar plot and cast of stock noir characters, but managed to pull it off with a little more ease. The first 25 minutes of Happy Time Murders starts off with a very strong noir vibe, but quickly turns into something else altogether. All the classic characters are there. The detective who is reluctant to take the case but is the only man for the job. The dame who probably knows more than she's letting on. The bad cop partner who learns a valuable lesson. And so on. But when it becomes something more along the lines of American Pie, the film noir aspect pretty much falls to the wayside. Hey handsome. You looking for some rotten cotton? I'm a woman. Melissa the Man. A running gag throughout the movie is that Melissa McCarthy's Connie is mistaken for a man, over and over again. While she may be dressed down in more masculine attire and not be wearing a ton of makeup, mistaking her for a man seems extremely far-fetched, and really doesn't make any sense at all. She's clearly a woman, as anyone taking one look at her face would immediately understand. It's played for laughs and obviously driven by the fact that she isn't playing a traditionally feminine or slender woman, but the idea that those two things are enough to cancel out her gender entirely is just totally crazy. Done once or twice in the right context, this joke might have actually worked well to deliver a laugh or two. But after the fourth, fifth, sixth, and more times, it stops being believable whatsoever. Critics aren't sure what appealed to Melissa McCarthy about accepting this role, though maybe it made more sense on the page than it does on screen. For 50 cents, Goofer will give you a felty. Allegory. Anyone who has seen the movie can tell you that there is a ton of allegory for racism in it. In fact, it's pretty much the main driving influence in the story. Phil was fired from the police force for, as the chief believes, being too lenient on his own kind. There are puppet slurs and lots and lots of trying to draw parallels to racism in America. But instead of addressing it with a point of view, it seems like it's all just there. Why even bother with the allegory in the first place? It's used more as a funny gag rather than the 
actually serious problem that it is. Similar to the movie Bright, Happy Time Murders is heavy with the metaphor, but instead of using it as a way to shed light on these very real problems, it makes the entire topic a joke. Now the movie is satire, and satire is about taking aim at otherwise taboo subjects and making light of them, but it usually does so for a reason or with a point of view. It doesn't make a ton of sense, and seems like it was just thrown in there to get the movie going. Oh, sorry about your dead human friend, Phillips. The Relationship it's super clear from the get-go that Connie hates Phil, like really and truly despises him. But why? Other than the general disdain that all humans have for puppets, we don't ever really understand why she so thoroughly can't stand her former partner. Phil too seems to have a hatred for Connie that isn't properly explained, aside from the fact that he was mistreated by the police force years ago. While it's a reason for him to be wary of her, it doesn't go into enough detail for us to understand why their conflict is so personal. But the writers don't give us enough to feel satisfied or to then root for them to make up and work together. So as an audience, we're left hoping that these two never have to see each other again and can just move on with their lives, instead of knowing that these mismatched but well-intentioned people can work out their differences. While not every relationship needs to be perfect, it's hard to connect to a movie about two people with an unexplained loathing for one another. That's why you don't swim in your own gene pool. Are all puppets crazy? For a movie that, at least for the first 20 minutes, tries to point out that humans are unfairly prejudiced towards the puppet species, the puppets themselves seem to be pretty disgusting across the board. While the humans are allowed to have all types of personalities and interests, pretty much every single puppet in this movie is sex-crazed, violent, or seriously addicted to drugs. Aside from Phil, who even drinks a fair amount himself and smokes like a chimney, all the puppets featured in the movie are completely out of control. Why is that? Is it something in their puppet? puppet DNA or simply the puppet culture that encourages all of them to act this way. And while most of it is played for humor, it just doesn't make a lot of sense that there wouldn't be any other type of puppet out there. Since we're supposed to root for the puppets and sympathize with the way that they're stereotyped and mistreated by humans, the humans making the movie seem totally uninterested with us feeling that way at all, or with portraying these furry little guys as anything but out of their minds. While the gag is seeing your childhood favorites in a whole new light, a little variation in their personalities could have been interesting and even more lifelike. Listen, I need your help to save him. Do you know what they'll do to a puppet ex-cop in prison? Phil's innocence. Brace yourselves, there are some spoilers coming up. After the Happy Time gang start being murdered in cold blood, the FBI bring in Sandra, who approached Phil for help in the first place to question her. Sandra lies, telling the cops that Phil is actually responsible for all of the deaths, and they take him into custody. Later in the movie, when Connie breaks him out of prison and he winds up killing Sandra, his name is suddenly cleared and he's no longer a suspect. How did that happen? There is a ton of fake evidence pointing to Phil as the guilty party, he just broke out of jail, and not to mention that he just murdered someone. In the eyes of the authority, he is definitely not an innocent man. And yet despite the evidence, he just walks away from all of the mayhem with no trouble at all. The audience really needed just a little more explanation as to how exactly Phil is exonerated. Do not come at me like that. Want me to go for my gun? Sandra's plan. Pretty much all of the events in the movie were part of Sandra's plan for revenge on Phil, but her plan itself doesn't actually make that much sense to begin with. While she orchestrated the whole thing in order to avenge her father's death, it seems wildly complicated for her to murder a bunch of people just to make him suffer. Wouldn't she be better off just attacking him personally, not going through a group of people that he doesn't even speak to anymore? Not only that, but Phil has already been kicked off the police force, lost his girlfriend, and has devolved into a seedy life of drinking and working as a PI. It it kinda seems like life took out its anger on him already, and it's a bit redundant for her to do so too. She even goes so far as to marry his ex-girlfriend Jenny and involve her in the plan, which involved faking her death in order to mislead Phil and make a getaway with the royalty money. It's an insanely detailed and complicated plan, which makes pretty much no sense and seems like a huge waste of time and resources in the end when she probably could have just been better off killing him in cold blood herself or something as simple as that. <sighs> General Confusion 
Possibly the thing about the Happy Time murders that makes the least amount of sense is how a movie with so much going for it and such a great concept could end up being so universally confusing to its fans and critics alike. Like Team America and Roger Rabbit before it, the Happy Time murders attempted to blend fantasy with reality, and in the case of Team America, to make it as lewd, crude, and over the top as possible. With an all-star cast including Melissa McCarthy, Maya Rudolph, Elizabeth Banks, Banks, Joel McHale, and amazing puppeteers like Bill Beretta working their usual magic, this movie had a ton going for it. Plus, the concept of seeing our childhood favorites go completely off the rails is a really thrilling idea. So what happened? It's very confusing how all these awesome elements couldn't pull it together to make a movie that would delight everyone who became huge fans of the trailer and would lead to some of the most scathing reviews of the year, if not the last few years. It's really hard to get a movie made by a studio, with so much interference and so many different voices all trying to work together, so we may never know what really happened that led to the Happy Time murders leaving us wanting more. Well, there you have it. What did you think of the Happy Time Murders? Do you agree with the critics? Or did you think it deserved a better reception? Were you confused by any of these things? Or do you have explanations we might have missed? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to Screen Rant for all of our awesome new content.